looks like we're good to go. We're going to get started this morning. We have uh, five fantastic medical students with us today. So we're going to be hearing from each of them. First, we're going to start with Hannah David. Um, she's joining us from University of Kansas School of Medicine, and she has a really interesting fact she shared with us. She's currently training for her fourth marathon. So if she completes this, that's over 100 miles of competing. So think about that. All right, Hannah. Well, thanks for that intro, Sam. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it that way, so that is exciting. Um, yeah, my topic today is about moral injury among ophthalmologists. So this is a topic that's been really close to my heart and hopefully create some good discussion today. Um, this topic was originally, oh, let's see if I can advance. Oh, there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Um, my interest in this topic was originally sparked by a surgery I saw during my second year of medical school. So I was in the OR um, during a Gunderson conjunctival flap procedure, and this patient had previously sustained a chemical burn to the eye, um, had light perception only um, vision and severe pain, but had actually recovered almost perfect vision with a corneal transplant. Unfortunately, he had been non-adherent with treatment and the graft had failed despite the best efforts of the surgeon. And now the conjunctiva was being closed over the graft um, just due to symptom relief to alleviate the patient's pain. So this really sparked my interest in moral injury, just kind of evaluating like regardless of how good your training is and how successful the surgery may be, there are just going to be factors outside the surgeon's control um, that may affect the outcomes. And how does this affect um, physicians and um, the people around them? So I approached one of my mentors with kind of this protocol of how do we evaluate moral injury in ophthalmologists and look at this a little bit deeper. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first study to quantify moral injury among ophthalmologists. Okay. So what is moral injury? This is a topic that's related to burnout, but it is a distinct idea. So while burnout focuses more on workplace fatigue, exhaustion with work, moral injury goes a layer deeper, and it evaluates on a more holistic level how do these workplace challenges affect provider well-being. Um, so it's based on a few different factors. It evaluates betrayal, guilt, shame, ethical concerns, religious struggle, loss of purpose, etc. It was actually initially used um, to describe the effects of wartime stress on military personnel who had witnessed combat, and it has been described as witnessing events that violate deeply held values and expectations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, since 2019, this has been applied to the healthcare context as well, as we kind of look at how do physicians experience this in a similar level as they experience um, events and situations that challenge their values. Um, one physician put it as the challenge of simultaneously knowing what care our patients need, but being unable to provide it due to constraints that are beyond our control. So several of these military symptom scales have been adapted to the healthcare context in recent years. And the most prevalent in the literature is the moral injury symptom scale healthcare professionals version or the MISHP. So in terms of the methods of our study, um, we sent the MISHP um, to several national ophthalmology listservs, and um, it scored on a scale of 0 to 100. Previously in the literature, it's been shown that scores at or above 36 um, have been associated with psychological dysfunction in individuals and relational difficulties. So this was kind of the cutoff for whether or not a respondent experienced moral injury. And then we just kind of sent out a broad demographic survey along with this. So we evaluated factors such as race, gender, age, years of practice, context of practice, um, insurance barriers that patients provided, and kind of just a broad swath of potential risk factors associated with this. Um, so you can see an example of the MISHP over to the left, again, looking at betrayal, guilt, shame, value violation, trust, and other issues. Um, we had a really great outpouring of responses from the ophthalmology community. So we had 335 responses from ophthalmologists. Um, 290 of these met inclusion criteria for our study. Our population was 57% male, 79.5% white, um, with a mean age of 51. The majority of respondents were in private practice. Um, about 35% were in academic, and then 5% were in a publicly owned practice. And interestingly, 24.8% of our respondents met criteria for moral injury. So one-fourth of our data set or ophthalmologists who responded to our survey um, experienced these levels, again, at or above that threshold of 36 associated um, with moral injury to a level that impacts their daily functioning. 
In terms of the risk factors, we initially had a lot of different factors that were associated, including length of practice, insurance barriers, um, whether or not patients appreciated care, and a few others that are listed here. Um, but when we ran it through a logistic regression analysis to control for confounding, actually only one factor was significantly associated with moral injury. And that was whether or not patients appreciated the care that was provided to them by the physician. So why is this? Well, I think there are a few factors that may play into this. It's been shown in the literature that physician job satisfaction is very closely tied to patient satisfaction scores. And ever since the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010, um, patient satisfaction scores have been prioritized as a means of um, a metric for performance and even for financial reimbursement in some programs. <laughs> Excuse me. So some programs have used this for physician salaries, um, as well as their accreditation in some states. Um, interestingly, Medicare now requires that patient satisfaction scores be collected. So again, over the last um, 14 or 15 years or so, this has really become an increasing topic of conversation and a metric for success. Uh, many physicians also spoke to the personal impact that patient dissatisfaction has on them and just kind of that natural human tendency to prioritize the one or two patients who weren't as satisfied with their care as opposed to the hundreds of cases that had gotten successfully. So what can be done about this? There's kind of two buckets of intervention that we saw in the literature. Um, the first is that of a root cause intervention. So we as a team um, on our research project would advocate to remove patient satisfaction as a metric for physician performance, specifically as it pertains um, to financial reimbursements. We would also say, and the literature has really shown that a culture of workplace support has been fundamental in um, reducing levels of moral injury. So this can take the form of providing education about moral injury, having regular team debriefings, and even individual counseling through cognitive behavioral therapy. As with any survey-based research, our, um, su our study did have several limitations. Um, we were susceptible to voluntary response bias. So we sent this again broadly to several national ophthalmology listservs. And since it was a voluntary survey, it's possible that those who were already primed to think about moral injury were more likely to respond to our survey. Um, as with any self-reported data, this is also a subjective measurement. So this is physicians describing their um, experience of what happened to them, which is, of course, um, subjective, but still we tried, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we tried to standardize this by um, providing a nationally accredited survey through the moral injury symptom scale. So in conclusion, um, our data suggests that moral injury may be present in up to one-fourth of ophthalmologists, which is a pretty impactful number, and is significantly associated with a lack of patient appreciation. This can be addressed through root cause interventions, and workplace support may be a protective factor. These are my references, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. Yeah, really, really lovely study. I I, I enjoy the topic. It, it's interesting to me that uh, as trainees, often we think of um, we think about that uh, it's negative feedback bias. So mm -hmm. you can have fifty great comments, and you know one comment from the uh, attending that you remember the rest of your life. And it's interesting that that seems to not change uh, later. Mm -hmm. uh, what surprised you the most that didn't come out as a factor uh, even to this? That's a great question. So I think one thing that we really expected to see as an increased risk factor was the insurance. Um, that's something that physicians had really spoke to of like really challenging when we have the perfect plan of care, but we just can't um, provide it because of insurance factors or our patient's ability to pay. So we expected that to be more significant. Um, we also um, were curious whether the context of practice would impact physicians, so academic versus private versus public. And we specifically asked about um, surgical complications and complications of academic faculty supervising residents who had had complications. So those were kind of the biggest ones we expected to see a difference in um, that really weren't shown to have an impact. Were there trends toward that? There were, Those yes. Yeah, yeah. So kind of going back to this figure, there was a positive um, correlation between those, um, but the p-values were just kind of on the edge. So I think some of those were like 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So uh, more data may have shown a difference. Um, but for that 90, we didn't see that being significant. Um, can you think of fashion is such a, a strongly, well, the strongly correlated risk factor? I wonder if there are ways to be more thoughtful about eliciting their satisfaction. Because honestly, 
what usually happens is they'll have a post-op, you'll read what the text wrote. Inevitably, the text will write like, post-op week two patient is complaining about dry eye, not as clear as they thought. It's almost always a negative mm -hmm. so It's never like patient is ecstatic. Yeah. Um, and then you go in and I'm always like, oh, I hear like, you're not quite so happy with your vision. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm super happy. And so it's almost like everything is, and the texture just like, well, I'm just writing down what they say. Mm -hmm. and I just wonder if maybe there was a way to be to on a scale one to 10, how happy are you with the outcome from your surgery? I think almost everyone is going to say like about 10. Mm -hmm. We just don't ask any information we're given from technicians is the like, Oh, well, of course they're happy, but they also said they're noticing a new floater now that they didn't have before surgery. And they really, that's all they talked about. And they said they were happy, but I didn't write that down because that's not pertinent what the floater is. Yeah. So I don't know, just a thought. Yeah, just kind of standardizing that more. That'd be really interesting. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thanks for getting us off to a strong start. Uh, quick announcement real quick. The original flyer did not have the event number on it. So that number is now in the chat on Zoom, or if you're in person, it's 269-052. That is the lucky number for today. <laughs> and next up, we have McKenna Morrow. She's a, a student from the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, she used to be speaking to us on MOG a peroneoplastic syndrome, question mark. Uh, her fun fact is that she has flown a plane before. So maybe she can elaborate on that and tell us the context. If it was a one-time thing or it's gonna be a future endeavor, but please welcome McKenna. Okay. Um, yes, I have flown a plane. It was actually my fiance's uncle's plane. He built himself. Um, he's a flight instructor. So I'm hoping to get my pilot's license eventually down the road when I have money. <laughs> Okay, so I'm McKenna. Um, I'll be talking to you about MOG, antibody-associated disease, and whether we should consider it a perineoplastic syndrome. The cases I'll be presenting are courtesy of Dr. Perchik, Dr. Sanchez, Dr. C, and Dr. Warner. So our first case is an 87-year-old male. He presented with progressive darkening of his vision that started around four weeks ago. He also had flashes in his, in his vision for about two to three days, but that resolved prior to presentation. He had no other symptoms and his review of systems was negative except for a 40 pound weight loss in the past year. He was initially seen by optometry who noted bilateral optic disc edema and sent him to the emergency department for an MRI face orbit and neck that showed bilateral optic nerve enhancement at the globe bilateral enhancement of the optic nerve sheath, as well as mild generalized enhancement of the orbital fat bilaterally. He was started on oral prednisone, 60 milligrams daily, and was seen by neuro-ophthalmology a week later. His visual acuity at this time was count fingers in both eyes. He had an APD in his left eye, and he still had bilateral optic disc edema. A fluorescein angiogram was obtained, which showed delayed arm to retina time at 26 seconds, um, delayed choroidal filling in both eyes, and leakage at the optic nerve in both eyes. He was admitted for concern for arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy at the time and was started on high dose IV methylprednisolone. However, his labs showed um, positive serum MOG IgG antibody at the titer of 1 to 160. And additionally, he had positive glutamic acid carboxylase antibody in his autoimmune encephalitis panel. Um, given the atypical presentation of his MOG antibody-associated disease, there was concern for perineoplastic syndrome, especially given his age and the 40-pound weight loss that he had over the past year. So he obtained a CT chest abdomen pelvis and a PET whole body scan, which showed introductal um, papillary mucinous neoplasms that had worrisome features, as well as main pancreatic duct dilation, which was concerning for cancer. He was recommended to undergo biopsy of the lesions, but he ultimately refused. Case two is a more typical presentation of MOG antibody-associated disease. It was a 44-year-old female. She came in with one-week history of eye pain, especially with eye movements and blurry vision. Um, interestingly, she did have a history of invasive ductal 
carcinoma that was diagnosed six months ago. It was treated with bilateral mastectomy, and she is now on anastrozole and gosarelin. On her exam, she had an APD in her right eye, as well as bilateral optic disc edema. So she was admitted, and her MRI orbits showed nonspecific bilateral scleritis and perineuritis. However, they were also concerned that she might have a leptomeningeal metastatic disease. So she underwent a lumbar puncture and a CT chest, abdomen, pelvis to work this up. Those were ultimately negative. Her labs were positive for serum, MOG, IgG at a titer of 1 to 1,280. She was started on high dose IV methylprednisolone as well as had plaques. Okay, so a little bit on MOG antibody associated disease. It's an inflammatory demyelinating disease. Its pathophysiology is not super well known, but the main factor of this disease is a positive serum MOG IgG. It can be a relapsing or a monophasic disease, and it presents usually with bilateral optic disc edema, and it can progress to transverse myelitis or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. The epidemiology is that it usually presents in the second or third decade of life and affects males and females equally, maybe a slight predominance for females. So should MOG be considered a perineoplastic disease? There has been cases presented in literature, 19 cases, that MOG is associated with cancer. Um, this could be either concurrent cancer, a perineoplastic encephalomyelitis picture, or the patient just has a history of cancer. Grouse et al. came up with a diagnosis guideline for perineoplastic neurologic syndrome. Um, and this criteria uses classical versus non-classical neurological syndromes, presence or absence of onconeural antibodies, and presence or absence of tumors. A classic neurological syndrome would be like a syndrome where a patient comes in and they're automatically concerned for an underlying cancer, such as um, dermatomyositis. That would be a classical presentation. Based off this criteria, you could then fit the patient in a definitive perineoplastic neurological syndrome or a possible perineoplastic neurological syndrome. They also defined what the onconeural antibodies are, and you can say whether those antibodies are well characterized, well associated with cancers, or partially characterized. I'll point your attention to the GAD65 antibody, and you can also see that they included MOG in this table. So using this information, looking back on case one, we had an 87-year-old male. He had a non-classical neurological syndrome because MOG is not considered a classic neurological syndrome. He had the presence of a partially characterized antibody um, with GAD as well as MOG, and he had no proven cancer. Based off of this, he would fit under the criteria of a possible perineoplastic neurological syndrome. However, he most likely does have cancer. If we were able to prove that, he would actually fit under the definitive um, criteria for perineoplastic neurological syndrome. As for case two, we had a more classical presentation um, of MOG. It was a 44-year-old. She fits under the non-classical neurological syndrome. She had breast cancer that was diagnosed six months ago. And she can actually fit under two criteria based off of whether you believe MOG should be considered an onconeural antibody or not. If you say, yes, let's follow Grouse et al.'s recommendations and say MOG is an onconeural antibody, she would fit under the definitive diagnosis for um, perineoplastic neurological syndrome. But if you say, no, we're not going to consider MOG uh, onconeural antibody, she would still fit under the possible perineoplastic neurological syndrome criteria. So as for our conclusion, um, MOG is a demyelinating disease that has significant morbidity, but it's not yet well characterized with other diseases such as cancer. Um, providers should have an increased suspicion for the presence of cancer, especially when your patient presents in an atypical manner, um, if there's presence of perineoplastic antibodies as well. And a recommendation could be that providers closely follow their patients for multiple years after their presentation of MOG just to evaluate and um, keep an eye on them for the development of cancer. Okay, so that is my presentation. Thank you. Are there any questions?
I have a, a I think what may be a challenging question. So if, if you diagnose someone with no known history of cancer, would you advise them of a cancer risk in the future and increased cancer risk? Um, so Dr. Warner actually sent me a very interesting manuscript the other day. Um, I don't think it's yet published. Um, but they looked at the prevalence of cancer in patients that had MOG versus just the general population. And they found that people with MOG are actually at a three time increase to develop cancer. Um, and also looking at Grouse's et al. criteria, they um, say you could possibly develop cancer two or five years after and or before the um, onset of MOG antibody associated disease. So. I think it's, I don't know if you would want to scare the patient and say um, you possibly might develop cancer, but I think it would be definitely a good thing to keep an eye on them closely. Thanks. Can you tell them, Judith? Do you tell them they have an increased risk of cancer in the next five years? I was not. I'm not well, it's not really aware the art the art has not been convincing as yet. Um it's you know working somebody up for a, you know like an unknown cancer is pretty big ordeal. And I do think it also depends on the situation, like you know, if you can really shy with mog and a little tighter and lots of other antibodies, I mean that's a pretty high risk. But you know, 14 year old kid with you know classic uh, uh optic I think that's pretty low risk. Yeah. Yeah. Not that yeah. And with all the cases, take each patient into consideration. Take their sort of consideration. And the article um, has been submitted um, I thought of Mayo, so they they'll have like you know the national database there on Mog can say once you pretty good it. But more to follow on that obviously has to be peer review yet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakana. And moving on to our next speaker, we have Dylan McBee who's joining us from uh, Bay. He's gonna be pronounced or his uh, topic is going to be opportunities and challenges facing student-run clinics. So Dylan, his fun fact, and this, these are his words, he said, in true Utah spirit, I got engaged while on this rotation. So huge congratulations. Um, hello, yeah, my name is Dylan. Uh, again, my title is Opportunities and Challenges Facing Student-Run Clinics. Uh, I've, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so, you know, what are student-run clinics? Well, student-run clinics, or SRCs, are broadly, broadly defined as offering free care uh, and operated by students under the supervision of qualified professionals. Uh, so student responsibilities can vary quite, quite dramatically. Uh, they include clinic and pharmacy operations, as well as financial stewardship, maintenance of electronic medical records, and clinic-related research. They've really become a major selling point for medical schools across the country, seeking to attract the most applicant, most competitive applicants uh, by offering earlier and earlier clinical exposure. And as such, SRCs have more than doubled from 2005 to 2014. They nearly doubled again by 2024 to almost 400 clinics in 39 states and 11 countries. Uh, in 2022, it was estimated that SRCs in the United States accounted for at least 300,000 patient visits. Um, now, the vast majority of student-run clinics tend to provide primary care services only. However, there is a growing number of specialty clinics that seem to boast services in ophthalmology, dermatology, plastic surgery, psychiatry, and even congestive heart failure management. As such, SRCs, SRCs serve not only a growing but increasingly complex role within the U.S. healthcare safety net. Uh, however, the question remains, uh, do SRCs consistently provide adequate care? Uh, we must recognize that patients do not choose to attend SRCs. They ultimately end up at these clinics for a lack of other options. And if there are instances in which the quality of care does not meet established standards, then this ultimately raises questions of beneficence, non-maleficence, and distributive justice. 
Um, this then begs the question, are students actually ready to run these types of clinics? Well, running a clinic entails challenges that medical students alone may not be fully equipped to manage. As you can see, um, even a cursory Google search can suggest that SRCs tend to deliver haphazard care. In reality, we really just don't have a great pulse on the quality of care at these clinics. The vast majority have never published any data, uh, and among those that have, literature is played with inadequately powered retrospective and cross-sectional studies that typically rely on convenient sampling. Uh, in short, these reported outcomes are unlikely to be generalizable to a broader national understanding of student-run clinic quality of care. Um, now, it's my belief that uh, specialty services in ophthalmology in particular face especially significant logistical challenges in this setting. Uh, 2021 national survey of some clinics that were offering eye care services found that the greatest internal barriers to continuity of care, maybe unsurprisingly, were physician recruitment and securing exam equipment. They also found that the most, external, uh, most common external challenge was a reported lack of infrastructure to actually ensure patient, adequate patient care follow-up. Um, at the heart of the issue with these clinics, I think, is that screenings are rarely actually coupled to adequate treatment options. Uh, the same study found that in, when continuity of care was provided or treatment options did exist, just two-thirds of patients scheduled for follow-up appointments actually returned to clinic. And of those patients sent to external referrals, just one in five actually made their appointment. Perhaps unsurprisingly, transportation issues were cited as the most significant barrier to care. Even when eye care services are provided, they also be, tend to be very non-standardized and vary quite differently between student-run clinics. An updated study from the Consortium of Student-Led Eye Clinics found that even basic eye screening services tend to be highly variable. Um, as you can see on the table on the left, uh, one in five clinics reported not measuring intraocular pressure in their patients, just one in two refracted patients, one in three performed automated visual fields, and methods of retinal examination varied quite widely, incorporating some combination of OCT, fundus photography, and direct and indirect ophthalmoscopy. Um, another 2024 study uh, further highlighted discrepancies in ophthalmic care. So this meta-analysis of diabetic retinopathy screening rates at student-run clinics found that annual DR screening rates among eligible patients really range quite widely from 5% to 86%. This meant that the majority of SRCs tend to fall below a national below the national average of 58%, and six of eight fell below a national target of 70% set by the Department of Health and Human Services. So, you know, how then can we ensure that all or at least more SRCs seem to meet can actually meet these rigorous standards for quality of care? Um, the first idea that's been floated is the introduction of an annual and mandatory national survey that re reports clinical impact and outcomes from each clinic. Utilizing this survey, we could then focus on research that actually prioritizes aggregate data with more generalizable outcomes. Then comparing care quality to national averages and national standards like we saw with that one study, as well as to other similar entities that provide eye care services like federally qualified health centers, all again, maybe you know, quite useful for understanding a larger national environment. Uh, we should also look at examples of clinics that are you know, largely successful and try to replicate these efforts throughout the country. So the Holmes Clinic in Houston, Texas, uh, recently added ethics officers or students that are specifically trained to audit ongoing and proposed clinical activities to ensure that adequate and responsible care is actually delivered. Um, the Health Advocate Program has also uh, recently been introduced, and this requires prerequisite training for all volunteers that teaches medical students how to actually navigate patients to best, the best local available resources, uh, depending on their needs. Uh, the idea is, this, of course, this will not only strengthen referral pipelines, but hopefully also increase follow-up by anticipating barriers to care. Finally, I do think there's a value in new technologies driving specialty care improvements in this environment. Uh, so innovative approaches like smartphone fundoscopy, artificial intelligence, and definitely telemedicine can enhance access to specialty services like ophthalmology. Looking back at that same meta-analysis, we found that uh, the Shade Tree Clinic, which is staffed by Vanderbilt medical students and faculty, was the only SRC to utilize a combination of in-house fundus photography and ophthalmology, and tel ophthalmology telemedicine services to yield the highest annual diabetic retinopathy screening rates uh, between clinics. Um, it's also funny to point out, Sean Collin was responsible for helping kind of set this up way back when. 
just a fun fact. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, thank you so much. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, question. So, yeah. I, I guess the stereotype for me of a student-run clinic is something that comes about a little bit by chance, perhaps. It's something that you know our, our own here at the University of Utah. There was a clinical site, a little bit of maybe perhaps an orphan site that um, that medical students were able to get involved in. And so I think about you know something just as straightforward as diabetic retinopathy screening rates. You know, you I recognize it's not a student-run clinic. They're not coming in. Um, so much responsible for the lack of screening, but I think there's a lot of challenges. Um, you know, this might be a clinic that just an MD's you know group of doctors are just kind of starting on their own, as opposed to being integrated into a broader uh, system. Uh, certainly, a lot of these uh, patient bases, knowing what student-run clinics are like, that, that's certainly a more challenging um, population with a lot more comorbidities. So, as you looked at the common threads between the student-run clinics, what, what do you think the, the biggest obstacle is that if overcome, the quality of care? Um, yeah, uh, I, I think you kind of touched on this, which is that looking across clinics um, and just like with any uh, you know, healthcare system, it's these silos of care, um, and then the disparities between the quality of care, the lack of communication between, between clinics. Um, I think being able to not only standardize care, but ultimately uh, connect resources better, uh, obviously probably the best way of going about that. Um, within a clinic itself, uh, I think, you know, the logistical challenges of getting physicians to come and, uh, and providing care year after year or, day, or even week after week with new trainees and new people that are at the helm of the clinic is a really difficult thing, but it's a clear solution. Thank you so much, Dylan. And again, a warm congratulations to you and your fiance. Thanks, Steph. Uh, next up, we have Connor Lentz. He's joining us from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, his topic will be Micropulse Transcleral Laser Therapy, a randomized control trial. And his fun fact is that he actually won the Junior Olympics for judo twice. Oh. All right. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, like Sam said, I'm Connor from uh, the Mayo Clinic. And specifically, I'm from the Mayo Clinic, Florida, which is also where I'm from. Um, that's in Jacksonville. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a procedure that um, my mentor does there. Um, we, similar to here, like to do a lot of different MIGS procedures and kind of variety of glaucoma treatments. And one uh, treatment that he does um, is micropulse, which is a laser therapy. And I understand that here at the Moran, um, this procedure is often re reserved for pediatric patients with um, refractory glaucoma, at least currently. So I thought it'd be interesting just to talk about um, our experience with it and a trial we have going on. I have no financial disclosures and this study is not company sponsored. So just to touch on background here, um, with most glaucoma surgeries and lasers, the goal is to improve the intraocular pressure by uh, improving the outflow or drainage of the aqueous humor. However, there is another method to treat glaucoma, which involves damaging the ciliary body uh, to reduce aqueous humor production. And I included a few of the laser procedures that are used to do this. Um, the first is continuous wave uh, transcleral laser therapy, which is kind of your classic diode that is used transclerally to provide enough energy to the ciliary body to cause coagulative necrosis. And this often uh, occurs with a popping sound as you essentially cause one of the ciliary bodies to explode. Um, and this can be done in a, a few locations. Um, in contrast to that micropulse, is similar, but it uses less energy over a larger area of the ciliary body um, to cause less damage or trauma to the tissues is kind of the idea. Um, Endocyclophotocoagulation is another uh, method that is more invasive and involves inserting a laser probe into the eye so that you can have visualization of the ciliary body as you uh, hit it with laser. So 
Microbles works uh, basically as the name implies. You take a continuous wave and you chop it up into these repetitive short pulses. And what this does is it allows like a heating and cooling kind of cycle um, on the cellular body, so it causes less trauma. When you look at images, I'm just kind of comparing the two, but pre and post continuous wave therapy shows that there is this destruction of the cellular body and surrounding tissues. Um, so it changes the structure quite a bit. But in contrast, when you look at micropulse, um, this is not seen to be the case. It's definitely less um, trauma, like I said, less structural change. And I've included a study. This, this is an old study from 10 years ago comparing the two procedures. And what this study showed is that in the long term, or at least up to 18 months, the IOP after each procedure ended up being about the same. However, the complications were noted to be quite a bit worse in the continuous wave therapy group, um, particularly with inflammation and uh, scleral thinning. And a more recent study that was actually published this year showed very similar results where the IOP after as much as two years was pretty much the same between the two procedures, but again, complications were a little bit worse than the uh, continuous wave therapy, particularly with hypotony and thysis bulbi in this study. So with the, the study that I'm a part of, um, we evaluate this micropulse uh, therapy in adults with uncontrolled glaucoma and what we tried to answer, a question we tried to answer was what parameters are best for this procedure? Because that's a hard part with laser procedures like micropulse is knowing um, how much laser and like what amount of time to do the laser. So that's just another thing we're looking at here. And by that I mean that we took 62 eyes and we divided them up into three groups. The first group, we did this procedure for 300 seconds. The second was 240 seconds. And the third group was 200 seconds. Um, and the main outcomes we're looking at are reduction in IOP and uh, medication uh, use at varying time points up to 12 months. This is just a little bit of kind of what the procedure looks like. So you take the probe, um, it is touching the sclera um, at the limbus and you go back and forth four or five times very slowly along one hemisphere and then you repeat the process on the other side for the, spe the specified amount of time. And you avoid the three o'clock and nine o'clock locations because that's where the neurovascular structures are. And I also thought it might be worth mentioning that we used um, a revised probe, which this came out a few years ago, and there's not a whole lot of studies looking at the efficacy of this new probe, but basically they switched out the tip to instead of being like a rounded tip, it's more contoured to the sclera to allow for easier sliding and maintenance of the angle, um, which is thought to decrease some of the trauma and even possibly pain in the, uh, in the patient. So for our demographics, most of our patients were Caucasian. Most had primary open angle glaucoma. There were a few other glaucoma types mixed in. Um, most patients were severe, had severe glaucoma, and several had moderate, and there were just a couple with mild. Most patients did have a prior laser or uh, glaucoma surgery that uh, they failed. So looking at our results, the IOP reduction ended up being pretty much the same, close to identical between all three groups after 12 months. And looking at the, the severity, it was worse in the 300 second group which is why there's a higher baseline IOP, which led to a greater initial decrease in IOP in that group. Um, but it also had the worst follow-up and more failures. Um, but essentially at the end, it was, it was very similar between all the groups. And we look at medication burden. There wasn't as impressive as a decrease in medications for this study. Um, it looked like at the six months time point that it had only really decreased in the 300 second group, but by 12 months it flipped and it was the, the other two groups with less time that resulted in uh, better medication reduction. However, it wasn't a whole lot for any of the groups and I believe this, that the reason for this is that compared to say a MIG study, for example, a lot of these patients had severe glaucoma that kind of made it dangerous to uh, take off medications. For the complications that we saw, um, they were actually quite minimal among all the groups. They were definitely worse in the 300 second group, 
Um, we saw more IOP spikes and uh, CME. There was one person that developed a cataract that was further down the line and may or may not have been from uh, this procedure, but the rest of the complications were very transient and nothing lasted uh, long term. And just looking at the, our success criteria, most eyes did were counted as successful. Um, they were definitely less in that 300 second group. And the reason for this is that several of them required a secondary surgery due to uncontrolled IOP, um, and only one each in the other groups uh, required another surgery. So takeaway points from this uh, study, we think that Micropulse is effective and safe uh, for adults with uh, uncontrolled glaucoma. Longer treatment times seem to cause like a greater initial decrease, but long term, they were all, all three groups are about the same. And it's possible that longer treatment times can be associated with more complications. But again, this is a little bit difficult to conclude since our 300 second group did have a bit higher severity at baseline. And that is it. Any questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Connor. And we've got one more speaker for today. We've got uh, Andrea um, Erigine. She's joining us from Stony Brook University. She's speaking on Through the Haze, a puzzling case of uveitis in a patient with gout. And her fun fact is that she actually won a professional doubles tennis tournament uh, in the Netherlands when she was only 16 years old. Uh, for some reason, she wasn't able to claim the prize money, but she was gifted a, a picture frame. I'm curious if you still have the picture frame and what you did with it. But please welcome Andrea. Yeah, I, I think I still have the picture frame. I'm not really sure where it is. It was a digital one, so it was a little bit fancier than a regular picture frame. Um, but I really wanted to play college tennis, and so I couldn't take the prize money. <laughs> Um, all right, so my talk is Through the Haze, a Puzzling Case of Uveitis in a Patient with Gout, and I'm Andrea. I'm an MD-PhD student from Stony Brook. I have no financial disclosures. Um, so this is a patient that we saw earlier this month, a 62-year-old man who presented with sudden onset like blurred vision and, and left eye pain for about a week. He noted an increase in floaters, endorsed photophobia, and um, eye redness. He has no past ocular history, no previous ocular procedures. Um, his past medical history is notable for gout. Um, and the patient was seen by Dr. Mamalis earlier in the morning and referred to the uveitis clinic that same day. And for past surgeries, he has um, surgeries over 30 years ago and no autoimmune disease that runs in the family. For his social history, so he's a retired land surveyor and recently worked um, at a ski resort. Um, he endorses drinking alcohol, tobacco use, and vaping. Um, sexually active with men and women, but no recent activity in the last few months. He has old tattoos, which has no history of like any raised lesions, um, and two dogs at home. Um, the rest of the social history was negative. For his basic eye exam, so he's complaining of left blur vision and eye pain, so his uh, visual acuity was light perception. Um, his pupils on the left were irregular and non-reactive, and visual fields were not able to be obtained. On the slit lamp exam, um, his, um, he had injection, two plus injection, mild chemosis. There was also uh, corneal edema. And then in the um, anterior chamber, he had four plus cell and um, three plus flare and a small 0 0.5 uh, millimeter hypopion inferiorly. Um, and his iris was poorly dilated. There was like posterior synechiae, um, and there was no view of the anterior vitreous. And notably on the unaffected eye, the right eye, there was uh, one to two plus cell and some minimal haze. So this made me think about like a hypopion and like the differential. Um, so there's many causes that can lead to a hypopion. There's infectious causes, which can be exogenous after a surgery or endogenous um, if there's some sort of systemic infection going on. There's also non-infectious causes, um, notably um, like uveitis caused by Bichette's or HLA B27. This patient did have gout, which if um, gout has been associated with a 1.5 fold increase in having uveitis. Um, and then there's neoplasia, which can lead to like a pseudo hypopion and like corneal pathology as well. So the differential is really broad. And in this patient, um, we tried to dilate and get a fundus exam. 
Um, we attempted at the slit lamp. We weren't able to get a view on the left. On the right, we had a good view. As you can see here, we obtained optos for the right. Um, but on the left, we had no view at all. It was hazy. And so then we did a uh, B scan. And we saw this like very dense um, heterogeneous opacification in the vitreous, indicating a vitritis. Um, and so this patient, 62-year-old man, left eye pain, blur vision, decreased visual acuity, hypopion inferiorly on the left eye, and dense vitritis noted by ultrasound, um, made us concerned for an endogenous and ophthalmitis. And then there was also a possible concern that it could be autoimmune uveitis. And so we made the decision to hospitalize this patient because there was also like um, indication of a possible vitritis on the right eye, and we were concerned about um, there being an infection that was now affecting the right eye. So we did a vitreous tap and inject of vancomycin, ceftazidine, and poscarnate on the left eye, and we also sent that sample um, for cultures. Uh, we wanted to start the patient. We want to get labs on the patient um, looking for um, different... Um, pathologies that can lead to like the vitritis. And then the patient was hospitalized with an endogenous workup so that they would get a lot of imaging like expedited and they were started on drops like atropine, duracell, and aphloxacin. So in the hospital, um, a lot of people were consulted, including infectious disease, um, who then figured out that the patient had actually been gardening three days prior to symptom onset. Um, and he was pricked by a thorn and had um, this like mass that was fluctuant mass that was found on the right forearm and it was scanned and it was uh, suspected for an abscess, so a possible source for an endogenous, like an ophthalmitis. And then um, he also disclosed that he did have a prior gonorrhea infection over five years ago, so another interesting um, um, aspect to his history. Um, and so we got imaging, all of them were remarkable. We got chest x-ray, CT, um, abdomen, pelvis, chest, um, and echo. Labs were uh, run and mostly unremarkable except for ANA was positive, which is a very nonspecific marker, but he had syphilis um, and he was HIV negative and he also had chlamydia. So this patient was um, also started on antibiotics for that. Um, and the, remarkably, none of the cultures grew anything. So we got blood cultures. We also got wound cultures. When it was the abscess was drained, um, we had cultures for the vitreous, but nothing grew. Um, and then we also did an aqueous tap on the second day once he was admitted. Um, and we sent that for the University of Washington PCR, which came back negative. So patient was treated, as I mentioned, on the left eye, but then also on the right eye, the vitritis was starting to worsen, so he received prednisolone uh, four times a day. He also received intraocular injections. So on the first day when he came in clinic, that was the vitreous tap and injection. Then on the right eye, after the aqueous tap, they received uh, vancomycin and ceftazidine. And then on the left, another set of vancomycin and ceftazidine. And they were also on oral and IV antibiotics. So initially, we were broad. So so IV ceftriaxone and vancomycin, that was pharmacy dose. Then the um, vancomycin was discontinued and started on doxycycline for the chlamydia. So it, it was interesting because I never really knew that uh, syphilis could affect the eye besides like, you know, the pupils that we hear about in medical school, but it can affect pretty much any part of the eye. And the most common presentation is uveitis. Um, and it's not that you know most patients with syphilis are going to have symptoms, uh, ocular symptoms. And so in the literature, it's anywhere from like one to two percent. I found a study that looked specifically in the U.S. like the cases between 2014 and 2015, and it was about 0.6 percent. Um, and the presence of a hypopion is not very common. Um, and in this case, it's hard to know if the hypopion is really related to syphilis, probably not, is probably for the endogenous endophthalmitis, um, possibly from the um, abscess. But it, it has been reported in the literature, and um, there's been also several like case reports looking at hypopion um, in the subretinal, uh, called, called the subretinal hypopion and a subhyloid, and it's more about the layering of the white blood cells. And, um, and then the visual acuity is really important. So for the outcome of the visual acuity, it really depends on timely treatment and identification. Um, and there is um, debate about 
the role of vitrectomy is um, it seems like if there is very dense vitritis, you really want to um, do a vitrectomy, uh, but it's not, there's not enough evidence um, to support either not or like doing a vitrectomy or not. There's also a role for corticosteroids um, and bustle, you have to be worrisome about other things that you wouldn't want to start steroids for. So it's still, um, unknown, but there are an increase in the number of cases of syphilis, um, despite us having penicillin and you know antibiotics that can treat the syphilis, there's been a rise, and so it's something to be cognizant of. And so this patient, a 62-year-old man with a history of gout, um, history of a gonorrhea infection, presented with sudden onset left eye pain, floaters, photophobia, and um, found to have decreased um, visual acuity, found to have inflammation in the anterior chamber and um, in the vitreous, and also mild inflammation on the right, tested positive for syphilis. Um, and then during his hospitalization, the vitritis worsened a little bit on the right before both improved. Um, serology, uh, like the cultures remained negative. Um, and this kind of was like a mixed picture of thinking maybe there was an early endophthalmitis um, and also an ocular um, syphilis, possibly more on the right. But um, it, was, it was an interesting case. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone who helped me, especially Dr. Larachelle and Dr. Altman and Dr. Wartz, who who were there in, um, in clinic and seeing this patient and also in the hospital. So um, with that, I'll take any questions. I do. Yeah. Were you surprised that the University of Washington PCR was negative against ocular syphilis? Um, so, so I didn't even know we would send <laughs> like the sample to the University of Washington. I know they run this very extensive like bacterial um, like fungal and uh, viral panel. I, I guess I, I wasn't surprised given that we didn't really grow anything um, and even in the blood culture. So to me, I wasn't surprised, but I'm not sure if it's very common to get a positive result from the University of Washington PCR. Yeah, syphilis, I just don't know if I've ever heard it. No. None of their testing, they don't test well. No, we don't expect it. Okay. At least it's positive in the eye. Okay. I still don't know if this was two separate things or if all of it's just explained by syphilis. I think just... You know, hypopian dense vitritis have to cover for endogenous and Um It's it's still unclear to me if he had two separate diseases or it was all just the syphilis to begin with. So, and he denied any risky sexual behavior to us. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't until he was hospitalized and grilled by ID that that came out. So he really has nothing to go on. Um, so. Well, thank you. Sure.